for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests waiting to be profiled are producer Paul Heller and author-engineer Matthias Levy. Producer Paul Heller was born in New York City. After attending Brooklyn Technical High School and Drexel Institute of Technology, he spent a short time in the Army Signal Corps. Then he came back to Hunter College. <laughs> With all his technical background, did you really think you'd go into the film business? Well, I was originally <laughs> going to be an engineer. That's um, what it sounded like. <laughs> yeah, no, and uh, you know, when I was 15, my father died, and he was he had a company that I was going to go into, oh. and so suddenly there was no, there was nothing, and I sort of drifted around. Oh, is that what happened? And, but I'd always loved working in the theater. I'd always worked sort of backstage in the theater. Oh, you had? When you were at Hunter, did you do that? Yeah. Oh, very active. We had a very active theater group there. Because they have a great theater. Yeah. Big, big audience participation there, yeah. right? Absolutely. So yeah. what were you doing there? But I also did lighting for oh, did? dances. So they had the theater was used for a lot of outside work, too. So I worked... Uh, I projected there. I did uh, did projection. I did lighting. I did stage hand work, stage management work. And we also had a very active theater group within the school. And within that was a young fellow named Salvatore Lambido, who w became a prolific writer. And he wrote a story under the name of Evan Hunter. Is that right? He wrote, and he was at Hunter College, he, Evan he, Hunter? He, he wrote under so many <laughs> pseudonyms. He also is the famous writer Ed McBain. Oh, of course. So Evan Hunter and Ed McBain are really were Salvatore Lambino. Oh, <laughs> I didn't realize that. I th was he from Boston or was no, he? No, no, New no, York. No, always no, he was New, a York. New York. Kid, yeah. So were you friends with him? Oh, yeah, very good friends, yeah. As a matter of fact, he got engaged to his wife. Uh, at a New Year's Eve party at my house. So was he an influence on you? In well, a only, way? only you know we were all so thrilled when he became successful. He he became successful quite young. And at the same time, you were all working. Well, what was the first actual moving into the film production or film business then? Well, I became I, I became a set designer. Uh, I, I worked in the theater, and from that, I evolved uh -huh. into designing scenery. And I became, at that point, I was the youngest member of the union, of the Scenic uh, Designers Union in New York, in the days that television was just starting. I see. And it was, you know, it was like a, a bonanza. I mean, there, there weren't enough people to do all the work. But you came from this artistic background. Then you ended up as an executive at Warner Brothers, right? Yeah. So that was a, quite a different thing. Well, I... Along the way, you know, I had designed some feature films, and I, you know, I knew how it worked. Yeah, and you mean from the back? From, you know, I mean, the designer's lucky, because by the time the film starts going, the designer's done all his work. So you sort of sit around and... and A watch? Watch oh. and, and get things ready for the next step, but you, you've done your heavy-duty work. So before, you're learning Beforehand, all the time. so you, you know, I, I kind of knew how it worked. Mm -hmm. And some friends of mine, Frank Perry and Eleanor Perry, wrote a screenplay called David and Lisa. Uh -huh. And I, you know, we were, we had no bad habits. We didn't know anything we was, about what we were doing. That was your first that into this first Oscar? It was an Oscar nominated? Uh, nominated for two Oscars. Uh, and we lost to Lawrence of Arabia. So how bad could that be, right? <laughs> yeah, no, but were you at Warner Brothers at the time? No, 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 no. Oh, this I was, was in way New York. Yeah, oh, way, way before. before. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't know a soul oh. in the business. I knew nobody. Oh, I didn't realize that it was way before. I thought yeah. you were like working your way. No, you had no, Sequoia no. Production uh, Company. Oh, that's much later. Yeah, after oh, I, much later. After, after I did my stint as an executive at Warner's. 
Oh. Yes, I, so I've done a few Lisa. more films. I did a few more films. Uh, one with a very famous South American director named Leopoldo Torre Nielsen. I mean, film aficionados will know him. Uh, and, uh, and what that, was that film? It was called The Eavesdropper. The Eavesdropper, and yes. And we used the girl from David and Lisa, uh, Janet Margolin, and the boy who was in uh, this film, uh, America, America, Stathis Yalelis. But Eavesdropper got awards all over for film Plata, awards. Mar yeah, <laughs> we won the best film in Mar del Plata and, and in the French film, in right. the French. Uh, and awards. Secret Ceremony also awards from Se Secret European. Secret Ceremony was in a way, I mean, it's something that I took and developed and worked on with a script and found Joe Losi to direct it. And oh. I couldn't get the money and this fellow John Heyman whose son is now the one who produces all of the uh, Harry Potter films. But John came through and uh, he had done some, he had been an agent for Elizabeth Taylor. Because she was in and that she, film. And so he brought her into it. And so I became a kind of an associate producer. It, it, but the thing I with, <laughs> maybe the thing with that is where it attached you so much to the British film industry. You're a member of BAFTA, which is yeah. their Academy Awards I had group. done a few films in England. And then, I mean, uh, when BAFTA first formed here, I had done, I think, three films there. Oh, you all had, did you, you obviously, you went there so and they lived invited and me, stayed. When BAFTA first formed, they invited me here, BAFTA Los Angeles to become part of After Los Angeles because oh, so I had been, I knew most of the people. But we call those foreign films. Those are foreign films in a way, in right? In a way, yeah. Um, they're not so foreign. They're not so foreign, <laughs> but those are where you garner the foreign film uh, awards yeah. because you did, you were associated with the Academy Awards and the Oscars with David and Lisa and uh, the Promise, and what was the other one? Le My Left Foot? My Left Foot, yeah. So was we, that made in England? That was made in Ireland. In yeah. Ireland. Yeah. But it was Which still is considered, same, yeah. is it considered American or English? English, English, English. Yeah. Irish. Well, English. So you Irish. have a thread going through there. Yeah, I also met my wife in there. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. Well, so I, you I do did have a, a thread. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did a film there called With Nail and I, and while I was doing that, uh, I, she was there working. She's an American, but she was working for oh. uh, UIP, which is a, a kind of a distribution arm for Universal Columbia and uh, Paramount. I think. Were you work? You weren't working with them, though. Were you always working with Warner Brothers? No. Oh, no. you weren't. I so was as an independent, independent, yeah. So, so as an independent producer, you started Sequoia Films. Yeah. And when when I left Warner Brothers, I came to Warner. I guess in 1971 and uh, while I was there I was an executive I, I oversaw pictures like Dirty Harry. Uh, and, right. Enter and the Dragon. And Well Enter the Dragon I produced. You did do that. Yeah. Okay let's, so let's, let's get to we, that. <laughs> after we left after a, a year at Warner Brothers uh, uh, my friend Fred Weintraub and I left uh, to form our own production company. Uh. And uh, one of the first films we made was Enter the Dragon, which was, was a huge Bruce Lee a thing. Giant! It introduced Bruce. Well, we had but met Bruce. But were you Bruce. a big producer by that time? Big producer? No, I was a small producer. <laughs> yeah. I was a, a big... modest producer, but 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 really, I mean, but had you had big films by that time? I hadn't done any oh, giant yes. films. So no. it was really this yeah. big giant. David, uh, Enter the Dragon was the first sort of blockbuster film. Really? The other films I had done had been artistic successes. And and uh, oh, when Warner's asked me to move out from New York to be part of the staff, it oh. had just been taken over by Ted Ashley. Oh, I and remember. Ted was, Ted was a New Yorker. He, Ashley, famous artist, his agency, right. and, they, and he became head of production there. And he knew who I was, and he asked me to come and join them as a producing, oh. as a producing uh, executive. So this big blockbuster took off, and then Bruce Lee left us. Well, Bruce sadly died before it, before it came out. He so knew you weren't able to do anything more with that. 
No. Except. <laughs> <laughs> well, after all this time, we are just in process now of doing a prequel. That's very interesting. How do you do that, and what do you? What is it? What is the uh, function of that? Well, uh, I mean, Enter the is Dragon it? has had such a loyal following for so many years, and. I think to a large degree because of Bruce. I mean, Bruce was such an amazing actor and such an amazing martial arts talent. And uh, so, but the story, the picture there has such a loyal following. It still plays everywhere in the world on television, kind of, you know, over and over again. And so uh, we went to Warner's with, a, with an idea as to how to do a prequel, which is in a sense how that character came to be that was in Enter the Dragon. Oh, so it's a new film. It'll, It'll be, be something totally, totally, totally new. new. And we will find, you know, I'm sure with a worldwide oh, like a search, young, the oh. young Bruce Lee. And then that'll be before Enter the Dragon happened. Yeah, before I Enter see. the Dragon well, happened. Well, talking about before and after, you're working on a documentary that's so interesting, too. Oh, what, what's it called? Um, it's called, uh, well, it, 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 we're calling kind it the of. American Dream, and it's the story. It it is a distillation, uh, and we don't know how many hours it's going to be yet because the subject is so vast. But on the American National Archives. Oh, that's really that could take forever. Well, the <laughs> National Archives are so vast. <laughs> the biggest problem is to try to even figure out how vast they are. Well, and then how do you? Well, we're going to go to. Press going it. to Washington and where they're headquartered, they have branches in 14 other places, plus all the presidential libraries, <laughs> plus the patent office, oh, plus right. all of the communications from all branches of the government. You mean the National Archives, not just the archives of film? No, the, the national. The world. They have, I mean, the US. they have George Washington's feed bills for his, oh for his troops. They have the first photographs ever made in the United States. They have nine million photographs in the archives. Have you already been working on it? Well, only hypothetically. <laughs> We're waiting. I mean, <laughs> as a matter of fact, when I get home, I've got to go send... Our contracts are going back and forth with the financing of it. The other thing that I think is fascinating is this documentary on In High Places. Is that well, what it's called? Well, that's not a documentary. That's going to be a feature film. It's a feature film. That's a dramatic film. film. But when, you t when I read about it, it seemed like it would be a documentary well, because tell us what happened. The no, guy who it, was climbing Everest. Well, it's the story of the first man, George Mallory, to ever ascend Everest. Nobody had ever tried to climb Everest before that. And... In, in the early 1920s, he went with a British expedition to Everest. First time that the uh, Tibetan government had allowed anybody oh. in, because they always felt it was very sacred. And the, the old Dalai Lama died, the new one, and you know the British pushed very hard because they didn't really care about Everest. They wanted to map Tibet. Yeah. And this was an excuse. Oh, they went to map. Oh, and they used they Everest. They used Everest as an excuse, and this young guy, George Mallory, climbed higher than anybody had ever climbed in, in, in anybody's lifetime. And he became back a hero. So Everest became an exciting place. Well, what happened then when you say they found the body? They found well, a body. Well, in his third attempt at Everest, he was about a thousand feet from the top. But he'd already conquered it once, and then no, he'd never reached the top. Oh, he'd he never, never reached, reached the summit. It. No, ah. each time he tried, they got higher and higher. And this last oh, this is time, it's a very exciting <laughs> story. The last time, it's about a thousand feet from the top. They were watching with the telescope his progress from below, and the clouds came in, and he never came down. So we don't know if he got to the we top or not. We don't know if he got to the top or not. Now, he, this was about three in the afternoon. He always had sun. They all had sunglasses because the sun is so intense. His sunglasses, when they found his body in 1999, 75 years later, perfectly preserved. His sunglasses were in his pocket. Unreal. So he obviously had been there after the sun went down. Oh, right. So there was this space of time in which he could have done it. 
<laughs> and you know, nobody will ever know. So I we mean, have to. He see. always had a little camera. They haven't found the camera. We he, have to see Paul Heller's in high places. <laughs> we have to see in high places. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. And I'm so glad you came with us. I know you've taught a lot at UCLA and NYU, and you've worked at the Skirball. And we're glad that you took the time to come and see us. Oh, well, it was a pleasure. You're a wonderful hostess. <laughs> Thank you. And don't go away. We'll be right back with author Matthias Levy. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Swiss-born Matisse Levy is a graduate of City College, New York, and Columbia University. He's a former professor at Columbia University and Pratt Institute, and he's lectured at the university's many universities throughout the world. Matisse has written several science books, things that I couldn't understand, but they were Why the Earthquakes, Engineering the City, Why Buildings Fall Down, and his latest, Why the Wind Blows. Engineering, which garnered awards in teaching and writing, is your specialty. How did they all mix for you? Well, basically, I was, I was a consulting engineer for many, many years. You know, I, I taught. Uh, that was not my primary function. I, I taught on the side. Oh, but, I see. But, but uh, no, I, I actually designed buildings and structures and bridges, and I did that for many, many years. So designing, designing those things, like you designed the Rose, Cent the Rose Center in New York, which is the newest, hottest thing to go and visit, the Javits Convention Center, the Marriott Marquis, and in Boston, the financial, one financial, in Argentina, in Belgium. Right. How do you get those jobs, and who actually goes about finishing what you've designed? Well, basically, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I, I'm employed by an architect. An architect uh, oh, they come engages to me to I do see. a particular project for them. I, I do the engineering work on the job. I see, I and, see. And uh, that's, that's how it all works out. So they come to you. Yes. And then you solve the problems. Uh, very often, yes. What are the problems in some of those things? Say, like in Boston or or Buenos Aires, didn't you do something in? Yes. Well, I've, <coughs> I've, right outside of Buenos Aires, there's a, a town called La Plata, and I designed a stadium there, which is very similar in terms of concept to the stadium I designed in Atlanta, which is the oh. Georgia Dome, it's the, a dome. the covered dome, and the the kind of roof that I use there is a, an idea that I came up with, uh, patented actually. And it's a, it's a fabric roof supported by cables. Very, very light and very, very airy. So it's, is it permanent? Absolutely permanent, yes. Because the fabric is a permanent fabric. Uh, and talking about these domes, I know you said you invented, it's called Ten Star? That's correct. And it is used all over the world. And it's used like out in a field, could you use it for big groups of people? Or does it have to be permanent? Well, it's it's designed to be a permanent structure, oh, it is. and uh, it's it's designed, you know, to to uh, be used in, a, in a, any kind of a permanent structure. That's why a stadium or in a large arena, those are the best uses for it. Why don't they use those kind of things over courtyards? Say, we have the museum here in Los Angeles, and there were it was those buildings were connected by different things. Why couldn't they use that kind of a skin or something like that? to close them together. Well, you can do that. And there actually, there are a number of uh, places where they've used uh, something like umbrellas over courtyards. But are we uh, out of the same material? Uh, made out of the same material. That's a, it's a fiberglass, uh, Teflon covered fiberglass material. They use it a lot in the Far East, or does it matter, or is it? It's actually, we, we actually designed a stadium in, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, which was built. Uh, it happened to have been an air-supported structure, but same material, fabric, the same fabric. It's been around now for 20 years. Does it wear out? Well, eventually it'll wear out, yes, and, and it'll be replaced. So and it's the fabric easy to will be replaced. So the structure underneath is always there? Structure is always there, and it's just like uh, you know, replacing your roofing. Oh, I, oh, was that right? Yes. Very interesting. So tell me why the wind blows. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> no, it's I, a history of weather, right, and global warming. Yes, yeah, so I came up with this uh, because uh, I, I had done two other books, one on, on why, why buildings fall down and then why the earthquakes, right. all about earthquakes and volcanoes. So, and I did those with my, my associate, my partner, who's now deceased, uh, Mario Salvadori. So I came up with the idea that I would complete the series and not talk about the weather. And I started writing about the weather. And as I got more and more into it, uh, it, it came, became very clear that what really mattered about the weather today is global warming, because that's the critical area that we're, we're coming to do. But do you think it's because of the time we're in now or because of what people have done? Well, basically, global warming really has, has, has uh, been shown to be caused by man. I mean, man has right. caused global warming. We, we st it all started because uh, uh, we, we came into the industrial age, started uh, you know, using a lot of machinery and uh, spewing a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that's how it all started. So I started reading this and I thought there were like really interesting things that I didn't understand. For instance, El Nino, explain that to us because that's, is it particular to us here? No, El Nino is a, is a uh, no, El Nino really has to do with an interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean. And there are... So it does affect us more because we have the ocean in California. Right. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a, phenom phen uh, excuse me, a phenomenon that, that actually occurs in the Pacific Ocean. Hmm. And it has to do with a change in the temperature of the waters where the, the warm water uh, shifts direction and moves uh, in a, an eastward or westward direction. But we can't do anything about that, right? No, that's a, that's a physical phenomenon. Uh, has nothing to do with global warming, by the way. It's but it's a, part of your book. It's explaining part of my book. what? Explaining why the wind blows? I mean, what's happening? Well, basically, I'm trying to explain all natural phenomena having to do with the weather. And that's, uh, you know, El Nino has a large impact on weather, not just in the United States, but uh, uh, in other places as well. Oh, because just because it's at the Pacific, then you're learning from it, or it affects the whole universe? Well, because of the interaction between the oceans and the atmosphere, mm -hmm. you know, when the oceans get warmer, that means the, the, the atmosphere gets warmer, and that means that it's going to carry over to different parts of the world. I see. One of the other stories that is included is Noah's Ark, the story of Noah's Ark. Well, the, I only include that in the, in the <laughs> preface to, to point out some of the uh, aspects of the, the story, which are really more apocryphal. Uh, it really talks about the fact that there was a, a large flood. Uh, the question of, of how big the flood was or where it occurred, uh, that's, that's really a, a question of uh, uh, faith at this point. Well, that's what I was wondering, but there was a flood. Well, there were, there were many floods, and it's believed now that there was actually a flood uh, that occurred somewhere in, the, in that region around Turkey, and uh, that uh, maybe there was even a ship, who knows, but uh, there was a, a, a rise in the Mediterranean and a, a, a passageway between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea opened up, and so oh, there was right. a sudden rush of water. Right. Well, I'm Armenian, so I think Noah's Ark landed on Ararat, right. which at that time was <laughs> Armenia. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the, um, and talking about Armenia and Turkey and all that Black Sea area, the Ukraine and all this, can governments do anything to uh, attack these problems that we're having with global warming? I'm going back to what we first started talking about. Well, we're, now that we're faced with global warming, we have to decide what we can do about it. And there are obviously a number of things that we can do about it. It's been, uh, you know, scientists have determined that in order to change or to, to uh, reduce the effects of global warming, we're going to have to reduce by almost 80% the amount of carbon dioxide we, we spew into the atmosphere. See, this is really true. This is really scientific. Oh, that's a scientific it's fact, It's not yes. just people talking. No, no, no. There are, there are effects of global warming that uh, we can no longer do anything about because it's been going on for a certain amount of time. But we're talking about the next right. time after, say, the middle of the century, uh, where, where if we don't do anything today, it'll get much worse. Okay, so what should we start doing in the last few minutes here? <laughs> 
Well, there are personal things we can do. Obviously, the, you know, uh, we can we can change the way we we uh, operate cars, go to uh, low you know, low uh, uh, mi higher mileage cars. We can uh, change light bulbs to uh, more efficient light bulbs, uh, increase the efficiency of uh, our appliances, and so on. Those kind of little things. But then, in effect, government has to do something. Government has to step in. We, if we do those little things, do they really make a difference? They do make a difference. They absolutely do make a difference because there are, you know, it's, it's, it's a question of how much each individual contributes. But if governments take over and they have to make sure that we do change our light bulbs, right? And that our, and we don't burn as much gas. That kind of thing, is that what they would do? Or do they have a larger program? Well, they have a much larger uh, vista because they have to look at uh, how power is generated, for instance. That's so they have to go to uh, uh, coal-fired power plants and then uh, tell them or mandate that they have to reduce uh, emissions. And uh, there are ways of doing that. It just costs money and it has to be done over time. Do you think that's too much telling the government telling us what to do or telling business what to do? No, I don't. You know, when when uh, there was a problem with uh, CFC emissions that caused the hole in the atmosphere yeah. in, in you know the, the ozone layer, uh, the governments of the world got together and said they're going to ban the substance, and they did, and it had an effect. Same thing can happen in regards to global warming. Is there any way that we can get to our governments to do that kind of thing? What should we do as as consumers, as human beings? Well, we all have an opportunity to talk to the people who represent us because they're in Congress. They can, they can uh, act. They can uh, force the government to take action. Um, why the wind blows uh, was very interesting. And I don't know if you, did you actually do these drawings? I did all the sketches and they were then- You did do all of those? Well, they were then uh, copied by a professional artist. But you, you actually, to make it easier for people to understand reading this book, did all these sketches and, and made it, uh, what, palatable for someone who doesn't understand engineering. Well, that's, exa that's exactly <laughs> right. And hopefully the way it's written, it's written in a very simple form so almost anyone can understand it. Well, I thank you so much. And thank you for bringing your book. Where are you living now? Uh, in Vermont. Oh, you do. You live Vermont. on the East yes. Coast, so we're glad you visited us today. Well, thank you. Thank you, and keep writing to Joan Quinn at 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 90017. We'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. <laughs>